we are a nonprofit. We are family members and people living with mental health challenges. And um, I, so I am a family member. I have a sister with a serious um, mental illness. Um, she was diagnosed when she was 18, so it's been in our family for many years. She's had lots of hospitalizations um, as a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. Um, and when my son was in high school, he was a junior at Mitty High School. He was a star baseball player. And um, when he started showing signs of his illness, I couldn't recognize it, even though I'd seen signs of that in my sister. Um, so the first thing I want to tell you is just because you have mental illness in your family doesn't mean you know anything about it. And the second thing I'll tell you is just because somebody has a diagnosis of mental illness, quite often they don't know much about it either. They might know what they're dealing with at some level, but they don't really understand the whole spectrum. Um, so there's a lot of stigma around mental illness, and it's still, there still is. Uh, things are getting better. We're seeing more uh, talk of things, you know, in the news. Um, unfortunately, we see a lot of misinformation in the news, so there's still a lot of stigma perpetuated around guns, mass violence, um, and mental illness that everybody who does those crimes, com you know, has to have a mental illness. I just recently heard somebody say, well, they're not in the right minds, and I thought about that, and I go, you know, you're absolutely right. But you have to realize that when somebody's really angry, when somebody is, um, you know, um, revengeful, they're, they're filled with hatred, they've been indoctrinated into some kind of cult or something, are they in the right minds? No, they're not. But they don't have a mental illness. So this is a big part of the work that we do. Um, we educate. Um, that's a, first of all, we offer support. So in the 70s, I'll tell you the history about NAMI. In 1974 in San Mateo County, this is when the, the asylums, which were originally set up to be uh, respites in places for people who did have mental health conditions to, to go and get care. Unfortunately, um, because of abuses and lots of other things, you know, um, that, that changed. Um, you know, they developed better medications for people who had uh, thought disorders in the 50s, and so there was a movement to get people out of the asylums because they felt, well, you know, they're doing better, why should they be locked up in a hospital if they have the new medications? So there was a, a movement by some attorneys to do that, but unfortunately it took a flip. Um, but the ACLU, the equivalent, got involved and said they started saying, well, no, all these people should live in the community. But guess what? There were no community services. So mental health, behavioral health system has been evolving since that time across our country. So 74, these families in San Mateo County, their family members were being released into the community. The housing was terrible, you know, the treatment was terrible, et cetera. And then 75, our county started a group, and by 1979, these groups were all over the country, and two women from Wisconsin started the national organization. Originally, it was called the Alliance for the Mentally Ill, and then we changed our name. So the support groups are what really got started, and also this was the era of the family blame theory. They said families cause mental illness. Well, I always tell people which came first, the chicken or the egg. If you have substance use issues, if you have mental illness in your family, you don't know anything about it, no one's helping you, no one's educating you, I think most families are doing the best they can. Are families dysfunctional? Yes, because you know they don't know what to do. And so this is the thinking around mental illness. Um, <clears throat> so in the 90s, they started developing the education programs. Because again, you know, the thought is, well, you take your medication, you get some therapy, and you go live, men you go live happily ever after. It doesn't work that way. You know, medications are not magic pills, and I'll be the first one to tell you that, because with my son, he was using marijuana, so I thought, oh, he has a drug problem. I started going to 12-step program, Al-Anon, Naranon, which I found extremely helpful. But, you know, it was a really a missing puzzle piece for our family, because what I know now, he would have had a childhood diagnosis, but they don't diagnose kids at that. He's 40 years old now. but. Um, 
you know, uh, we, we were, when he was eight years old, we were told um, by a local, you know, community mental health agency that we should take parenting classes. Well, we took parenting classes. We became the facilitators of the parenting classes for three years. They told us to get therapy. We got therapy, my husband and I. But, you know, again, if therapy doesn't address substance use and mental health issues in your family, you know, it's, it only goes so far. So when I found Al-Anon and when I found NAMI's first education program for families called Family to Family, Key to Understanding, um, those were the big missing puzzle pieces. And I thought, well, how come nobody knows about this? How come nobody's talking about it? How come it's not integrated into therapy? Because if you don't address the elephant in the room, you know, it only goes so far. But fortunately today, this is becoming a reality to address these issues. Um, mental, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health, they, fo they decided about five or six years ago um, that mental illness is being treated just like heart attacks and uh, cancer was being treated in the 70s. We waited till people had full-blown heart attacks. We waited till people had stage four cancer to treat them. So they started doing research to find out why you have heart disease, why you have cancer. And now today, you know, the death rates have gone way down. The treatment starts a lot earlier um, because of that research. So now mental illness, they are doing this research at Stanford, UCSF, and they're looking at families, they're looking at children, they're, they come, Stanford just has this family-focused therapy that they're doing that they found both with the control group and the, um, the families that they were going to provide more services to. They benefited greatly from it because they were addressing the elephant in the room, giving them that psychoeducation, even though they knew the parents have bipolar, or have depression, whatever it is. Nobody really talked about it. Nobody really addressed you know, what it really meant, how, looking for early warning signs, how you can prevent hospitalizations. So this is the direction research is going, so we're very help, hopeful. And it's prevention, early intervention is the model. The schools are now getting mandates to look at you know, what's going on. We don't want them diagnosing kids. You know, we need to leave that up to the behavioral health people. But we want a partnership, you know, get rid of this blame game. It's the schools, it's the family. And, you know, to partner around the success of this child and find out what's going on and how, how you can work with it. So that's a little bit about the history of NAMI. I, you asked me to come here to tell you about Laura's Law. And again, we're not lawyers, we're not people who um, can really talk on that level. So I did bring some factual things, but I'll tell you again, you know, relating to the history, when they started releasing people to the community, um, instead of being hospitalized, a lot of what's been happening in the last 40 years is people have been starting, been being arrested. So our jails and prisons have become our mental hospitals. And um, unfortunately, the laws, I always tell people the system is sicker than the people in it because our laws are set up that you can't really do anything until somebody is attempting suicide, they're a danger to themselves. They're actually trying to hurt somebody or they're gravely disabled. And the gravely disabled thing is almost a joke because the people you're talking about that live on the streets, they're not considered to be gravely disabled. If you can eat out of a garbage can, if you can live in a, under a bridge, you know, you're not gravely disabled. And so this is what we're saying about the system, that we need to integrate and we need to focus on the, the big picture, from children to adult. You know, and we have too many people in prisons, we have too many people on the streets, and you know, we don't have all the answers, but this is where I think communities can really come into play. Um, a really good book I recommend people read is called Crazy, and it's written by Pete Early. <coughs> he's a, a former um, Washington Post reporter, and he's a novelist. He's written several novels. And he wrote this book because he himself, his son developed bipolar disorder. So this is an excellent story of what he has gone through as a family member, what his son has gone through. His son got arrested for taking a bubble bath by breaking into someone's house. Shortly after he was taken to the hospital by his parents to get hospitalized, but he didn't meet the criteria. So he left the hospital, took off, 
and he broke into someone's house and he took a bubble bath and he got arrested. So isn't that an absurd story? But this is the absurdity, absurdity that we have to deal with every day. As family members, we're frustrated. Um, you know, the, the our behavioral health system is evolving. You know, they are working now with the jails more. Destination Home is here today, supported housing. It's really an important program. But we have a lot of problems as a result of what has happened over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, we have a mobile crisis team here now, and you know their job is to assess if somebody is ready to get hospitalized. Again, I think we need to look at this picture. Why are we waiting for people to have to get hospitalized against their will, you know, to get arrested or to become homeless? Because those are the things that happen when we wait that long. It's really true. And we need to do more prevention, early intervention all the way around. So what happened is um, the, the laws in California, the LPS, which is Lanterman, Petra Short, that were developed for people who have these serious mental illnesses, set up the criteria for you know, how you get people hospitalized. But again, you have to wait till they're so sick for that to happen that in the meantime, there's a whole big window before that where you might be able to engage with somebody. You might be able to get them treatment. And the, there is a, a model called assertive community treatment. And, um, and then there's a model called a, um, assisted outpatient treatment. And they're basically pretty much the same, is that it's all about engagement. It's a team of people that works with the people you're talking about on the streets, that works with the families that are calling all the time, trying to get their person help. And they come out, they start working with the person, trying to engage them to prevent that from happening or to provide the treatment that they need, to put them in the community, in housing. But you don't just give somebody a house that has serious substance use and mental health issues. They're not gonna keep their housing. They, they can't, they need help. They need uh, people coming to them on a regular basis and they'll be paranoid, there'll be lots of things, but you work in engaging them until they start trusting them and then they start engaging in their treatment. You also bring in the peers. The peer model is really, really important and it's a model that California has not signed uh, until we're hoping with Governor Newsom, he'll sign it, these peer specialists, so that these agencies can actually pay peers to be part of their teams. That's why they don't have them right now, because they don't have the funding, unless they find a grant or some other way to do it. But the peers should be part of these teams, just like the AA model is so successful because it's peer-driven. You know, somebody who has a substance use issue is helping someone else that they're their sponsor. We're doing peer mentoring in our little local nonprofit with people who are in the hospital that they can get a mentor who can help them transition back to the community and work with them for six months with two phone calls and one visit a week. That's all it is. And we're seeing really good results from that. But these peers should be everywhere. They should be in emergency rooms. They, they should be on all these teams because they've been there. You know, they've been homeless. They've been hospitalized. And so that's part of what needs to be on all these either assertive community treatment team or the assisted outpatient treatment. Now Laura's law was actually enacted um, in California and I think it was in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it's a law that um, it's up to the county to implement. It was actually, the, this model was started in New York because they had an incident um, where a man who was going in and out of hospitals, he had no one following him with case management or anything. See, so he was actually going voluntarily to hospitals too. And he, one day he was at the subway and he pushed a woman in front of the train. She happened to be a social worker and her family, bless, bless them, realized that this was a person she was trying to help. And so they enacted this, they call it in New York, um, Kendra's Law, I think it is. And they enacted this assisted outpatient treatment model. They took the assertive community treatment model and said, you know, there needs to be a piece. This is a shame that this man who's actually trying to get help by going to the hospital, but they don't keep you long enough and, you know, just putting him, keep putting him out, um, that he needs somebody to help him. 
So they're the ones that initiated that, the parents of, of this woman that was killed. And um, it's a very successful model, and it's, it's in this engagement piece where you have a lot of people working with them, but there is a civil, dis civil order that's attached to it. They call it the black robe effect. So um, that w when there's a judge involved, that sometimes people will want to engage sooner because they think they're going to be arrested or be in this, the court system. They don't want that. So that's what basically that Laura's Law is. And um, there was one county where this uh, happened in California, same kind of thing, and it was Nevada County, and they enacted, you know, they pushed for this law, they enacted it right away, and now, just in the last few years, several other counties have started to implement it. it like I said, it's been a law for many times, but there is a lot of misinformation about it, because again, you know, it's not going to be like, oh, you can just pick everybody off the street, put them in a hospital, <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. But the engagement piece is what is really important. And what I would encourage you as a community is that these people are people, and I know there's fear of be, you know, that we're all afraid of it. But you know, you might just want to start saying hi to them. How are you doing? Maybe give them that garbage bag that the city can't afford to give them anymore. You know, I mean, think about things you can do in your own neighborhood to try to help this, get them hooked up with destination home or find out what is available. You know, there's a lot of things that are. But we do find that through our organization, and we're a resource for people when they're ready, um, if they want to get support, we have a support group every Sunday for them. And we have support groups for families. We have combination ones. Uh, we have education courses, the family to family that I mentioned. It's now an evidence-based practice because they've studied it. They know that families that have this kind of uh, education and support, that they can keep their families together and they can deal with it. And they can manage it. And also the person has a much better outcome as well because they do need families and they do need supportive communities. And a lot of the homeless people have burned all their bridges with their families, but again, I think that's another part of that engagement process is to find those families because a lot of them are very hurt. They don't even know where their loved ones are, you know, and they want to be reconnected with them. But, you know, it is a process and it is, you know, everybody helping to make this happen. And so um, I think the education is critical. Um, you know, if you are a family member, to get this education and get the support. If you are a person, we have a peer-to-peer -peer recovery education program, which is a nine-week course, again, taught by people who have mental illness. They have schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, anxiety, all kinds of things. But, you know, mental illness does not discriminate. Our classes look like the United Nations. We strip away all the politics, all the religion, you know, all your cultural things because we're reacting to it as human beings. And, you know, we become a family. Our, our, our classes and the people who work at NAMI and volunteer are from all walks of life. They're from all different, you know, ethnic backgrounds. And, you know, we're here to end the stigma and to fight the discrimination because there's still a lot of discrimination. We have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work environments that discriminate against mental illness, um, people who have disabilities and don't know how to work with them. And, you know, that's, they lose billions of dollars of work and lost productivity because somebody calls in sick all the time whether a family member or something deal, somebody dealing with something. So we have a lot of work to do. And we have to think of mental health and physical health go hand in hand. It's a spectrum. We're all on it in our lifetime in one way or another. But there are some people who have severe mental illnesses. They, they have thought disorders. And they don't think they're sick. Just like somebody has a stroke, you know, they have, there's a term called anonosagosia, and, you know, they, they're paralyzed to one side, and they don't think they are, because the perception part of their brain has been damaged, and, and this is what goes on with some people who have serious mental illness. They may never, ever accept that they have a mental illness, but there are ways to engage with them, there are ways to get them into treatment, there are ways to... Um, get them to accept some medication on some levels because it helps them think clear, helps them sleep or whatever. Instead of being shoved, oh, you have this diagnosis, you've got to take this medication the rest of your life. It doesn't work. You know, we have to meet people where they are and help them and support them. And, and there's lots of success cases all across the country where we're doing this and we need to bring it here. So, 
anyways, that's all I have to say. I, I don't know what time I have, but we, a destination home is here. And I think when you hear what they're doing, they're doing really good work. And um, we're here for you. If we're a resource center on Bascom Avenue. Welcome to come in. We have books, tapes. We have a warm line help desk. You can call 10 to 6, Monday through Friday. And we have, there, we're all live, have lived experience on that line. And um, we're having our walk, unfortunately, on the 21st, the same as the homeless. But uh, we're going to be downtown San Jose. And we'll have about 1,500 people if anybody wants to join us. So thank you for having me. Pass out, please. That was uh, that's very inspiring, Kathy. Thank you. And I brought uh, the law, so you can. This is a person who helped write the law, so he answers questions if anyone's interested. And this is the evolution of the. Uh, this was just a webinar that SAMHSA did, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Agency. That's our government agency working on all this really hard stuff, and. Um, so if you want to see the webinar, I have the link, but those are the, po the slides. And then this is our resource guide, which we have published on our website that has a bunch of support groups, not just ours, but all throughout the community. And support groups are a really good way to start uh, for people who want to get help. So I'll pass this out too.